I'm sure you all have seen the casualty rates the Confederation has endured in every confrontation with the Xylax. The numbers haunt me still. Entire army groups were gone in a matter of scant hours, overwhelmed and torn apart. Armor divisions disintegrated by bio-titan weaponry. Our garrisons ground to bloody chunks by relentless advances of their warrior forms, and our fleets gutted and torn to scrap metal on the orbit of every world we defended by fleets that darkened the stars and clogged the sky. The Xylax do not bargain and do not engage in diplomacy other than the absolute surrender of the invaded species. They harvest the biological material of the living to create more of their own. They are monstrous and engage in any type of warfare that might provide a tactical advantage. They feel no fear, but they understand it well enough to abuse psychotropic gas, terror tactics, and the targeting of civilians and the wounded for maximum psychological effect. When we were told a new race, humanity, would join the fray, we were all less than enthusiastic. What was one young race more to throw to the meat grinder of war, a few more ships to buy ourselves some extra minutes for the evacuation of civilians and wounded? Barrack talk is corrosive when morale is low. We began to wager on how long would mankind stand and fight before running scared back to their home system and awaiting extermination, how many hundreds of thousands they would waste in this hopeless war. The bets were as depressing as our chances of making it to the next day, and then they came. The Xylax threw their first ground assault over Cavernicus, and the 17th Army Group was ordered to win time, to delay them by any means necessary. We had been given human reinforcements, who called themselves the Fifth Order, whatever that meant. Apparently, they had a seasoned commander from the last interhuman war of unification. We couldn't care less. Well, I am sure the Xylax cared even less. At first, that is. If any of you has been lucky to never see those thrice-cursed bastards go to war, I bless your minds, my kinsmen. The Xylax are unnatural. While our current investigations point to them being a heavily genetically modified race from before the foundation of the Confederation, we didn't know, nor care, of their origins that day. They swarmed with their infantry, fear-inducing bioforms of flesh and bone created from every biological form they killed, captured and harvested, with graft weapons and enhanced and modified for war. Behind them came their spider tanks and heavy, super-heavy armor that crushed the ground on grav engines. Their lightest armor dwarfed our heaviest, their bio-titans could take battalions by themselves, and their ships would lay brutal orbital fire, uncaring of friendly fire or civilian casualties. To them, we were more flesh to harvest for them to create new warrior forms for war. And so they came firing corrosive bolts of acid that ate tanks and bunkers, beams of catalytic energy to melt and bubble flesh and bone, and then they came with sharp and blunt appendixes made from bio-enhanced bone like saws, blades, spikes, and mauls to butcher, kill, harvest, and feed. I had seen enough friends die to know how dangerous, how unattainable the defense was. Still, twenty million life forms counted on us holding the line. So we tried. I swear to you, we did try. With our heaviest armor anchored behind defensive positions and plasma shields, with artillery enough to level mountains and war striders that dwarfed the buildings of the cities we defended, we fought with all we had. A hundred species ready for war, plasma and laser weapons at the ready, servo armor clean and prepared, trenches dug and men on their stations. We engaged them at 0712 local hour. Our lines began to break at 0823 local hour. The perimeter was broken at 0901 local hour, ten minutes longer than the most generous predictions gave us. I broke protocol and chain of command to beg the humans to send anything they had to the spaceport to protect as many civilians as they could at 0902. 
I am sure you all have read the transcript of my court-martial. Yes, I did shoot my superior officer because he refused to swallow his pride and ask for help. Yes, I regret nothing. The humans responded at 0903 with one single communication on an open channel. Understood Agita command. Starfall has been authorized. Knights on their way. Look to the heavens. We are coming. So I looked up to the sky. I didn't know what that word meant, knight. The translator did not render a definition, but a simple explanation. Mounted soldier in armor, that glitch to someone devoted to a cause. At the moment, I couldn't care less. Then, I saw it in the sky. Have any of you ever seen an actual meteor shower? A real one, not the hollow fictions? Then you have seen what I saw. Hundreds of points of flame and light descending from the heavens like fine rain, like legends, form a doomed era. I remember thinking how few they were, and how little strength they had to offer. And yet, I was amazed. They had thrown themselves into the fires of the nine hells, willing and able, and their descent brought some fire into my men, who dug down and refused to give another inch until the humans arrived. They came to die with us. The least decency we could offer them was to stay alive until they got there. I managed to get lines reformed and contain the zealot in a dozen breaches along the entire perimeters when the human commander requested coordinates for what he called nightfall. I did not know what that was, but I gave him the breaches. Understood. He said, laughing, I suppose at the sheer suicidal wish he had to have. Brace for impact and clear splash area. Tyrannies are inbound. I laughed at it, too. Splash area? What were tyrannies? I did not know, but I didn't care at that point. We had breached full with enemy armor, and my forces were beginning to shatter at points, so I proceeded to reinforce those points with everything I had. I remember seeing the Xylac spider tank crawling over the wall at Breach 6, covered in warrior forms and weaponry, its thick arachnid legs bringing it over the wall, spewing fire and death. I fired my pistol because what else could I do? There were Helixians and Tanithians at my side, firing all they had upon the thick hide of the beast. We weren't even denting it, but we had run of proper anti-armor ten minutes earlier. The previous tank that had breached the perimeter was dead on the other side of the wall thanks to some madly brave private that had ran and jumped on it before detonating two full belts of grenades. We didn't have more madly brave privates, and even if we did, we did not have any more grenades of that yield. The tank fired its main plasma accelerator at a squad at my left and turned them into half-melted bodies before training it back on us. I remember wondering what death would feel like, and if there really was something after death. Then came the sound, like a shrieking that turned into the roaring of some death whirler beast, evoking something primal within me, an image of scales, claws, fire, and wings that covered the sun. And they landed right on the tank. The shock wave was brutal, sending me to the floor and the warrior form on the tank flying. The tank buckled and fell down, its armor cracked and shattered, fluids and blood oozing from the impact zones. A strange and eerie silence filled the breach for a moment as I managed to get up and look at what had happened. A lucky orbital round from our fleet? An unlucky shoot from theirs? Space debris? My answer came from the smoke. There were five, only five. They felt like an army. Covered head to toe in sleek black armor that made them taller than any Felixian or Oropero, they looked like mythical depictions of gods. The black armor was adorned by marks and sigils I did not understand at the time, and some I still do not. But there was one I could comprehend, the mark of leadership. The first of the figures wore some kind of holographic armor over its power plate, a bright orange flying quadruped reptilian with open wings, a storm raging behind it. 
Its helmet mirrored that. Taking on the shape of the head of said reptile, the visor lenses shone under the stout of the beast, its ears flourishing into wings of office that adorned the helmet. Its cape flew to the wind almost lazily, in deep orange. Yes, it had a cape. An actual cape on a battlefield. I also remember thinking it seemed so stupid when the battle was over, but at the moment it gave them the semblance of mythical might, of having exited some fairy tale for children where they would slay every monster from beyond the stars and decided that the Xylax were worthy enough of their wrath to come out of those same fairy tales. And the damnest thing? It wasn't the cape, the decorated armor, or how they had reached us. It was their weapons. They had shoulder-mounted ordnance and weapons slung on their lower back. But their hands held no rifle or long gun, but blades, hammers, and daggers. The leader, the reptile-decorated warrior, had two long blades, one in each hand. Another of his companions, with a roaring golden feline on its chest and the same storm behind it, carried what seemed like a breaching axe our firefighters used to enter buildings, just alien in look and much more deadly in aspect. The third, a giant of a creature among its peers, that towered over its fellow, had a brutal two-handed hammer whose head reassembled some type of canid. On his chest, was the same canid, standing howling on some massive pillar. The storm, too, raged behind it. The fourth was in comparison a lot shorter and was crouching over a warrior form, poking it with one of its many and varied types of knives. The armor in this one was decorated with bones and feathers of some kind, making it look like the devil of some primitive story. It wasn't as if the others weren't intimidating, but this one seemed made for it. It had a collar of teeth around its neck, and it seemed to be trying to cut pieces of the dead warrior form until it realized they were still living ones around. The last one was also smaller, but taller than the last one. The armor showed a blue tree of some kind, standing proud among a storm, and on its hands was, to my relief at the time, an actual weapon, long-barreled and scoped, for a few moments, no one moved. Then the reptile warrior spoke on open channel and speakers. The laws of chivalry demand of me to give you a chance for surrender or retreat from this world. The offer is made. Choose quickly, or face Jovian wrath. It took me one insane second to realize it was making the offer to the Xylax. One insane moment of asking me how would be so stupid to make such an offer to a species hell-bent on the extermination and incorporation of every biological life form there was. The Xylax, as expected, opened fire on them. It was then the true carnage began. After what felt like an hour of constant fire, but were mere seconds, the Silas stopped and surveyed what was left of the five humans. Among the smoke, the same voice spoke up. We will take that as a polite thank you, but no. Tyranny Amaranth, cleanse them all. Then came the hypervelocity slugs. I had seen rail guns fire before from cruisers and heavy tanks, never from shoulder mount. Like blue fire, razor-sharp slugs of metal tore enemy warrior forms from their feet, tearing them apart into chunks of flesh. One volley, five knights. Two dozen dead warrior forms. I still can't believe it. From the smoke where they had vanished, they charged forth to melee, which seemed even more suicidal than giving the Zelax terms of surrender. I fully expected those hulking flesh minters to tear those five apart. It was then I understood what the word knight meant why it was defined as a mounted warrior in armor and a human devoted to a cause. Earth, their home world, is a death world, but we never saw anything particularly dangerous there. Sure, there were some impressive fauna and flora and dangerous creatures that could kill with mere touch, but the reason it was a death world was the humans themselves. While not physically impressive, at least not more than our more fit races, they did have two dangerous gifts— 
One was their nearly limitless fountain of creativity and determination to keep moving forwards. They did not relent or retreat if they could achieve something. In that aspect, they seem impressive and even laudable. The second part, in their psionic gift. I am sure most of you have heard the rumors humanity experimented on itself to achieve a sort of transcendence into the field of psionic. It is true, confirmed to me by their high-ranking officers, and an open truth among their people and society. They have wondrous abilities, like communication telepathically, increasing their own speed and physical might, and much more. I lie before, Senators. They have another gift, although I would prefer to refer to it as a curse. They can apply anything to war, and their psionics are no different. They have armor linked to their very... I don't want to use such an archaic term as soul, but that is what they call it, weapons powered by their mind that cut through reinforced ship plating with ease. They can make things combust spontaneously. They can cast actual lightning from their hands. They can fly. Actually fly. I barely saw the reptile warrior when he shot forward on some sort of anti-gravity harness that allowed him to achieve a degree of mobility that seemed almost magical as it cut and shredded and vivisected Xylax warriors like paper. It was shielded for I could see the shimmer of a protective aura every time it slowed enough for me to catch up to its movements, even if no shot found him. At range, it was deceptively deadly with its shoulder-mounted cannon and the weapon hung from his hip, a sort of assault rifle based in acceleration of projectiles to a percentage of the speed of light, all of them making short work of the warrior forms. But up close... Had we been an inferior race that believed on supernatural creatures, I might have compared them to gods of death. The humans did have a comparison to make. They called them angels of death. It was a proper nickname. I saw the one with a hammer crush tanks with it, the sniper suit leader, forms from impossible ranges, the lion warrior with its axe, carved transport open and tear them to shreds. The one adorned in feathers carved Xylax, warriors like animals, searching for weak spots and just putting the fear of humanity in them. Five human knights. It was all it took to hold that breach, and they deployed a full one hundred of them to aid us. It was like seeing veritable myths. The speed, power, and ferocity of them, how they seemed to know exactly where the enemy fire would come from before it actually came, how they read each other, and how they dealt with threats. I saw a knight cut the turret of an enemy tank and fire his gun inside while two of its companions killed commander forms that rushed him. In perfect sync they moved and killed, and when united in those five soldier teams, those tyrannies, they became whirlwinds of death. The reptile warrior he was. He killed so many Xylax warriors, commanders, and armor that when he rushed back among the last of his kin to enter the evacuation vessels, he was so covered in blood, oil, and radioactive dust, his engineers had to cut him out of the armor. And he seemed pleased by it. They all seemed so. They joked, laughed, and shared feats once we were in transit. I had the Pleasure, I suppose, to travel in one human cruiser whose name I will never forget, the Reign of Vengeance. The crew seemed to hold particular pride on those men, as if they were some sort of symbol of humanity. They acted like it, always proud, always determined, every time they entered a room, the sailors would salute and stand to attention, even if by my understanding they didn't have to. I asked why. A commander of an infantry unit called Alastor Whiteborn explained it to me. These knights are among the most gifted psionics of humanity, trained to the breaking point to form a corps of enhanced super-soldiers capable of facing any threat in packs of five. These packs were called tyrannies, because an ancient predator form human myth, something called dragons, formed packs that were called tyrannies. These tyrannies formed wings, that then formed flights, and those formed thunders. 
I asked why I call them thunders. The reptile warrior, who I would later learn was called Cyrus Amaranth, of Europa, a satellite around their gas giant Jupiter, explained it to me. Ever heard the sound of almost a hundred knights flying through the air? It's the thunder that is heralded by the coming lightning, and as such, we are only heard after we have already struck. We didn't win that battle. They didn't have the men or supplies to maintain a prolonged engagement, but for the first time in years, our casualty rates were lower than the inflicted upon the Zelax. And I don't know what Admiral Kuopan will tell you, but I saw the Zylax fleet as we left the planet. The human vessels are on another scale entirely. Their flagship was six of their kilometers long, twice as big as our biggest dreadnought. Their rail guns can send absolute tons of firepower across vast distances in mere seconds. And their energy lances, their pulsar and ordnance are far above anything I have witnessed. I nearly cried of joy when their ships began the progenitor of all orbital bombardment upon the Xylax forces on the ground, turning the surface of the world to molten glass and denying those bastards any scrap of biological material. So... As my personal judgment and recommendation to this august organ of the Confederation, I would like to be blunt and speak what I really believe. Shut the fething up. We cannot win without humanity. It's a fact, not some opinion of a dust-neck infantryman. They have technology and firepower beyond us, because for centuries they fought each other to almost annihilation and they learned to wage war in ways we have barely dreamed of. They understand conflict, they understand battle, and they thrive in it. They have fought among themselves for millennia until now, and their unity has not made them weaker. And more importantly, they have a ferrous moral code that willed them to assist us in the first place. They didn't have a reason to assist us, to drop from the sky and lose a dozen of their knights and hundreds of common soldiers to save us. They did it because, by Knight Amaranth's own words, it was the right thing to do. They value things like honor, duty, right, and truth. They believe in ideals that for them are millennia old and only recently decided to return to the center of their Vey society. They fight for what it right, and for those that cannot fight for themselves. We need their help. We need their ships. And we need every damned knight they have to win this war. They have armies of infantry trained for war and veteran from conflict. Battalion of armor that makes our own armor look pitiful. And from what I heard and saw, their war striders are made to conquer continents. All of this coordinated by their psionic gift, their unity, as they call it. They are a fearsome wand, war-tested engine of war, and they do not appreciate it when innocent blood is shed. They are hungry for war against such monsters, to fight enemies like those, to engage in pure warfare against something purely evil and that cannot be reasoned with. Maybe it is not enough. Maybe it never was. But for the first time since this massacre began, we made the Xylax hesitate. They have slowed their advance to the southern and northern rim, and their full frontal offense to the mid-rim has stalled. They are building fortresses and defensive networks on conquered and harvested world, something they had never done before, and bringing from dark space some sort of void stations. They fully expect us to go on the offensive with humanity's aid, to strike back now that their momentum has been robbed and they have been proven beatable. I say, Senators, let's not disappoint. Call the reserves, fire up the furnaces of the war industry, open every arsenal we have, lift all restrictions in armaments for the Confederation, and give the humans all the aid we can afford, all the resources and information we have on the enemy, and let them do what humanity has a history proving they excel at. What I saw during the weeks of transit back here to this August organ, reading every history book on mankind, form their world wars, to the eugenic crusades, to the unification of the moons, the Cooperian Blitz, and the massacre of the inner belt, from the rise of the Hierophant's court, 
to the Dragon Fall and the Dragon Rise battles, from the First War of Sol to the Third, from the cry of the blood of Mars to the War of Cinders, from the breaking of Luna to the defense of Earth, killing monsters. Field Marshal Udique, during the Senate session, spoke for the inclusion of the authority of Sol to the Confederate armed forces during the tenth year of the Xylax invasion. After this, Lord Commander Tassendane Leonatos was given command of the Easter Front, while her husband, Lord Cyrus Amaranth, took overall command of the Northern Rim. As history would prove, those were the most effective fronts and the only ones to eliminate a Xylax-Woolard form.